heat treat day. Get this knife in here propped up on little chunks of brick and stuff and handle frame is there propped up on some brick with a little wire handle I can grab with tongs. Got them in the 24 inch deep double barrel model Paragon furnace. This furnace has got the Argon purge option, so I am going to flood this thing with Argon to reduce scaling. Ideally, I would be heat treating a knife like this out of molten salts, and I'm gonna get that set up at some point, but for right now, the Paragon with Argon is working nicely, so let's pick a program. Let's see if Program nine is the one. Nope, it is not. Program eight. I need to keep a booklet with these. Full ramp. Whoops. Full ramp up to 1490. Yep. Hold that for an hour and a 25 minutes. We're not gonna soak the blade anywhere near that long, but I am gonna do a normalize on the blade and on the frame. And so, argon on. No second ramp. Start. So the solenoid will start, or not the solenoid, this solid state relay will start clicking here. There we go, now we're heating up. And uh, when we get up to about eight, 900 degrees, I'm gonna cut the argon on and run it up to about 12, um, cubic feet per hour, which is a pretty good, per, that'll purge this pretty quick and then keep a good amount of argon flowing through while we're austenitizing this knife and handle frame. And I'll put the camera on a tripod and um, video the normalizing and quench for y'all too when we get there. Here we go guys, let's do the handle frame first. Brick over here. Then um, let's do the blade. Now we don't want to bend the tang or screw up the threads at all. tip good. Now we're going to get the guard a little bit more so we don't get excessive auto temper. And we are going to swab that off with the towel. And call it quenched. in this one, I'll tell you what. Okay, now 
let's have a look. We've got a little cross breeze blowing through the shop right now. I don't want to hold it sideways to that cross breeze because even a thing like that can, at this point, cause it to warp. Okay, point looks centered. Yeah. Edge looks pretty straight. Just had to shove the middle over a little. Spine's still good. Glove straightening. Pretty damn hot even through the glove. Check the tang alignment from both sides. Looks good there. And it doesn't have to be perfect, perfect. It has to be visually good from a quick ins inspection and straighten like this for now. You know, no major warps or issues. But then after temper, we have um, tricks that we can use to straighten it as need be, should anything arise. Not super crazy about that. And I do try to look at it against various backgrounds, both light and dark. Sometimes you think you're seeing it pretty well, but then if you switch it to looking against something else as a background, you'll see it better. Okay, oh, now what's happening? Also, it's important to keep checking it as it cools down because sometimes things will move during the cool down process that weren't initially there right after the quench. Yep, yep. With a recurve blade, that's not uncommon for things to wander around in terms of this portion of the edge being aligned with the heel. So that's very much something to stay conscious of and look for. The blade is still hot. It's still cooking. straight from the top. Yep. It's just got a portion of the edge down there at the um, waist, so to speak, right here that I need to make sure is aligned with the center of percussion out here in the belly. Look at it from kind of an angle like that. That actually looks pretty good there. Let's have a look there. Hmm. Do we have a little bend here? Not sure about that. Anyway, nothing is really jumping out at me. So, at this point, I'm going to cancel the oven out. I'm going to open it up, dump the heat. So, so I can get it down to a tempering range as soon as possible. While that's happening, I'm going to take and put this uh, knife end frame in the house oven at 300 degrees for a, well, probably 340 degrees for a snap temper just so nothing has an opportunity to crack on me while I'm getting down to a temper heat here. So. so here we are after quench and a snap temper, which seemed to go fine. 
this um, frame did close up a little bit at the guard end and it'll it'll spring with not very much force to be open to the same dimension that it started out at but I'm actually going to leave it on the tang here sprung open a little bit and give it a couple of real tempers and hope that that kind of chills it out and like resizes it back to original dimension I don't really want too much spring tension on this in the installed um, condition. Anyway, now we're going to go in for a 375 degree temper, and then we'll pull out and Rockwell test it. I'd like to get to 59 on this, and if we're still too high, then the last temper I'll go to like 400, but we'll see. And we're in. Now, stop back. Program. Let's go. Um, five. Ramp. Full. Up to, uh, no, let's, let's ramp it at 400 degrees per hour. Up to three. 75 and hold that for two hours argon off second ramp uh, none so since we are going to rock well test it in between tempers here uh, I'm not just putting two cycles into here. We'll pull it out, cool it down, put it back in, and then just run cycle five again. Or modify it and then run it again. All right, so while the blade is tempering, we're going to make the final nut for the um, tang end and the takedown. We're going to use this nominally 5 16th stainless rod stock. So let's see how big it actually is. Just slightly under, 311, 310. So let's call it 310. That's um, 60 thousandths of an inch total that would have to come off to get this down to quarter inch or 30 thousandths per side if we were to turn it off. And I'm thinking about this because if we want to use a quarter inch box wrench on this for final assembly. We're going to need to mill some flats on this. And uh, so now I have a number that I can shoot for in terms of how far to mill down for each flat. We'll find the surface and then we'll mill down 30 south thousandths of an inch on each of six sides around the edge of this thing. And, uh, and then Hopefully, then we'll have good flats with fairly crisp corners, but let's see what happens. So, some of you guys will know about machining things, and some of you guys won't, and some of you guys will be kind of in the middle of those two extremes, like I am. Um, if you've never had to make a round thing or a square thing hexagonal, why, uh, here's one way that you can do that. Probably the most accessible and just common sense way. So I've got uh, the 5 16 stock. I'm gonna find the 5 16 5C collet. We'll put that in there. Now we're gonna get uh, the collet block set here. Has got a square block and a hexagonal block. We're gonna use the hexagonal block. We're gonna put our 5C collet down through there. And then we're gonna get the closer for the end of the block. We're going to screw that on there. And at some point, it's gonna to get to the point where it begins to tighten the collet. So we need to get our stick out correct. We're gonna mill that much of a flat on there and then uh, we want to get it to where 
we have the closer tight enough on there that we can get some significant pressure when we close the lever. Because that lever is what's going to hold the thing from shifting while we're milling it. So you need some pressure on it. And there we go. Now we're ready to throw it in the vise. Let's get this guy out of the way. And we're going to stick it out of the vise. Over in this direction. We're gonna get it pretty deep into the vise so we don't have the vise um, jaw racking on us. And make sure it's pressed down to the bottom of the vise bed and snug it up. Now we're good to mill a flat on there. You get the keyless chuck out of the spindle. That's just held in a collet. And we're gonna pick a I'm going to go with a fairly large cutter. You see how the edges are on this one? Corners aren't super blown out. I think that's going to work for us. Let's have a look at this one. Which one's better? I think the first one I grabbed is better. All right, now we need a collet for it. That's a three quarter collet. Cool beans. This is a uh, index 645 vertical mill, and it has a brown and sharp number nine spindle taper, which isn't ideal, but I did manage, manage to find a new set of collets back when I bought this mill, and so pretty much everything I do is just held in collets. I got that tightened up. All right, let's do it. We're going to find the surface. And then uh, real quick, I'm going to reset the um, the knee dial. I'm doing this without a digital readout, readout so I'm going to reset the knee dial to zero. And then uh, I'm going to crank it up by 30 thou. And now we have our depth for all of our cuts, so we should be good to go. Go ahead and uh, tumble it. And then do the opposite flat. One thing I kind of learned about doing these is that, at least in my mill, it works better if you just don't go sequentially clockwise or counterclockwise. I like to tumble it around and do opposing flats. Okay, there we got our six flats on there, and we're ready to go ahead and throw this in the lathe and pop a hole in the end of it, thread that, and then we'll clean up the finish on these flats a bit. So, call it block, hex milling. If you keep watching my channel over time, you're going to notice that Whenever I use this lathe, I'm gonna crow about it a little bit. This is one of the one of the pride and joys of my shop. A 1953 Pratt and Whitney Model C, 16 inch tool room lathe, actual swing, 18 inches, seven and a half horse three phase, thousand RPM top speed. 
everything in good working order. I'll be fixing a few little uh, peccadillos that this machine has over time on the channel, but man, I've had a couple of lathes that I could get work done on and it was way better than no lathe, but I finally got this last year and it is an absolute joy to work with. Plus, I mean, it just looks super cool. It's got the classic machine tool design, just a big, brutal machine. It's 5,500 pounds of metal turning power. So uh, with all that said, here I have the Jacobs Rubber Flex Collet Chuck on it. And uh, it's got a collet in it that's too small. So we're gonna take that out. We're gonna put in the appropriate size collet for this 5 16 round stock. And uh, just start to snug it up. We're gonna throw the, the tang nut B into there. And we're going to close that collet up until it is snug. There we go, hammer it a bit, get a good grip, lock the ring. Now we're ready to turn. To bring this up, we're just gonna face the end of this bar off real quick. And let's, let's drop that a little bit. We're not quite on center. There we go. Got that. Got the 10 horsepower phase perfect turned on to make our three phase and let's go. I'm gonna use uh, 453 RPM for this. That's a good general purpose speed for this kind of work I've found. And we're good there gonna get all this out of the way. Because now we are just drilling and tapping a hole. using a center finding drill bit first. Tighten it from three points. Trying to get it centered in the chuck as possible. These old Jacobs chucks. Um, and then we'll get a run out. Wish that wasn't the case, but that's what it is.
316 step. clutched so the motor can run without the spindle running and then you can feather the spindle on or off and have it break uh, to a stop or not which is just an amazing feature on a lathe not that common these days but uh, I think it should be it's uh, definitely preferable to like an electronic foot brake or something like that because those don't actually act that quickly if you're in trouble for one thing. For another thing, being able to feather the clutch on these is incredible. And then not having to turn the power the motor off to change spindle speeds. Um, it's all good. Older machine tools, quality ones tend to have clutches. All right. Cranking some 1028 threads into that hole. Got the good tapping lube, super lube. You can tell the difference between this tapping lube and uh, just any plain old grade of oil that's not engineered for tapping. This stuff is where it's at. So we have a modified bottoming tap here. I ground out of a broken taper tap. So we're pretty near to the bottom of that hole. Now, uh, I think for style points, I'm just gonna part this off. So let's put on the parting blade. And we're gonna need to reset the angle of the tool post so let's bring that over and do that and that looks good Glue too tight. Let's get our height nailed. It is not quite nailed as is. Drop that a little bit. Needs to be full on uh, dead center of the end of the workpiece. Otherwise, tapping can get a little bit horrible or uh, parting. You know what? I'm even going to extend this a little bit more from the spindle just to clear the uh, clear the tool holder a little bit better. And let's go for it. This machine's got a clutch lever in two positions: one at the headstock one at the uh, carriage, which is also an easy feature. We're going to get some oil.
Bob's your uncle. There's the nut. Let's go trim it, finish it, call it good. Boy, parting on a machine that doesn't have rigidity to it is no fun. This thing, no chowder at all. Just keep it lubricated. If the tool's on center and any kind of sharp, it just cuts stuff off. Slick as a whistle, no problem. Let's have a look. There's the nut. I wonder that dimension. Oh, 250 thou. So we're good with that. And uh, it fits a little quarter inch wrench quite nicely. Uh, the nut is a little bit long at this point. It's tapped to a quarter inch deep. Um, so I'm going to catch quite a few threads, quite a lot more than this um, original nut that I had just for assembly, rough, rough fitting and stuff. So it's going to be a, a actually better threaded than this nut and more threads. Um, and then I will actually trim the top of this barrel down only to the degree necessary that it will fit into the frame between the tang end and the end of the inside of the, the handle frame. So I'm gonna preserve as much height of threads as I can and as much height of the nut as I can. The other nice thing is I'm gonna to have to relieve the scales quite a lot less on the inside due to the smaller diameter of this hexagonal nut. So after the first temper, we are Rockwell testing. Took a few tests, averaged them out, and I'm showing the result here of the average on this one. So I've made the first load, applied the secondary load, now I'm clicking the lever back, and it shows 59 Rockwell C scale, so just what we wanted. So we are not adjusting the tempering temper for the second cycle the uh, temperature and we're just going back into the oven to give it two more hours and now with a nice sharp 120 belt on we're going to do the rest of the finish grinding at 120 get our scratch pattern good work up into our plunges how we want them <clears throat> get them to a nice finished 120 And uh, really finish dimension everything for the last time here. Change anything we, we might want to while we're still at this relatively coarse belt. I'm adjusting the fronts of the guard here. Just a little bit more even with each other. A very slight difference manifesting in the front of the guard lug. And just being creative with angles. Seeing where you can reach into with the platen. A little slack belt section, everything like that. And lots of little fast hand wobble movements just to get the roundness of the spine and the um, mellow convexity to the top of the guard tuned into each other using that little unsupported belt section right there and uh, so it's looking pretty clean at 120 work on the guard a little bit more You know, Broadbeck actually sells um, like a deep version of the platen arm, so you get a much bigger cutout, so you can really get the handle in there better from both sides when you're grinding like that right there. Um, 
but better yet, I am going to get a left-handed Broadbeck grinder from them. So exactly this same grinder, but everything mirrored. You can order it, order it that way. We'll put that on the bench next to this one. Now I can get all the left side of my handle stuff perfectly like I can on the right side on the platen on this one. You just have a pair of right and left hand mirroring grinders. Now we switch to the Gator. Um, that's a 3M Trizac CF. A100, it's about a 200 grit to, yeah, 180 to 200 grit finish here. Very good for getting those ceramic belt 120 scratches out. And this sets it up well for a Gator A45, which is about a 400 grit equivalent. And we are just getting down to the finished look this time. This is the last time we're going to be hitting everything up with belts after heat treat here. I'm going to make sure all the decarb is off of everything so the etch looks even. Then just blend everything and save ourselves a lot of hand sanding by doing a nice job on the grinder first. And of course that means that we have to go in and polish the front of the scallops get every little area of this knife that's been shaped with a belt grinder and then hit all of those areas again with every belt in the progression and just focus on keeping everything crisp not washing it out blending where it's needed but retaining crispness too And you can see there I'm putting a very small chamfer even on the front of the scallop and all the way around the edge of the guard everywhere. A little even chamfer just so it doesn't feel sharp, doesn't look too sharp. It looks evenly chamfered all the way around. Nice little trick. Back to 120 on the blade. I think I'm getting the plunges here. Just finishing those up. Probably thinning the edge a little bit too. I like to finish thin the edge a little bit toward the end at 120 grit. You can see I'm working in close to the plunge there at the angle of the plunge. Just kind of feathering the whole thing in there. And just walking the grind up to the spine right in front of the plunge cut. Looking pretty good so far. Now check out this next step. So we're um, finished ground up to 400 on the fittings for the most part. Uh, A100 here on the Ricasso. Uh, 400 down the spine and uh, 120 on the flats here. At this point I'm looking uh, at the alignment of the blade to the handle frame and I'm seeing that it could be a little bit straighter so I am going to stop here and do a little bit of straightening. Now this is a hardened blade with a pretty thin edge. You may be asking yourself what the heck is he gonna do and uh, is he fixing to crack that thing? Well. Here's what I'm going to do. I employ this pretty frequently if I'm in this sort of situation. This is a little uh, eight ounce ball peen and uh, it has a broken end mill with a little cross peen face ground on it. This is a carbide end mill with a tiny little cross peen or straight peen face ground on it. Jammed into a board hole on the end of this hammer to make a quickie carbide planishing hammer. I'm going to planish straighten, so I'm going to do this sort of a thing. Just 
hard enough to where I can see little dents from this. The uh, blade is at like 59 Rockwell, but this is carbide, so it'll dent it no problem. I'm just making uh, an expanding pattern of small dents um, with the lengthways axis of the dent this way. So it's actually, it's working like a cross paint on the surface of the material, or straight paint. And uh, it's stretching the skin of the blade this way from point to butt of the knife. So what happens is, because that's just a surface effect on this side, it actually starts cupping the blade that way um, to basically make the dents on this side the high point of an arc. And I do it on the spine first and then I move it down toward the edge. supported to where you're getting a firm bounce feel from the hammer. It's already doing something. You can actually overdo this by accident. You need to be careful not to do that. I think I've done enough on the spine here probably. Let's just do a little bit farther out. Don't want to, you don't want to hear any clack or very little clack. You should be feeling firm contact under the hammer and it should be bouncing. Move it around on the anvil until it's well supported. Let's have a look at that. It's definitely better and I've definitely done enough up by the front of the handle I just do a little bit more right out about here I learned this from Eduardo Berardo the excellent Brazilian bladesmith um, who showed it on a bit softer of a blade using a, a very hard steel hammer face um, and then I would try it with like AEBL blades at 62 Rockwell and it wouldn't work uh, and then I figured out you had to use carbide for the hammer head because the hammer head has to be harder than the blade whatever the blade hardness is It's looking pretty straight. And get a little bit more though. That'll do it. So I do this when I'm finished ground up to 120 grit normally because these dents come out like immediately at 120 grit if I go over them now. You won't see them anymore but their effect remains. If you notice something farther down the line and you're at a 400 grit hand sand, well then all you got to do is do this and then jump, drop back momentarily in the affected area to like a a 400 equivalent gator belt, the uh, A45 or whatever, 
and then these will wipe right off too and then you can just kind of go back to finishing your knife and etch it pretty quick so anyway i thought i'd show that because it's pretty helpful for subtly finish correcting things after they're hardened and here's the surface of the blade you can just see a bunch of tiny little dents i use this as a bending moment in the blade and then a little bit more up here so that will be straight straight with the handle frame so the plunges are finished up to 400 grit you can see they are even with each other and the same size as each other and they are polished inside up to 400 grit smooth arc mostly straight nice curve to the top smooth arc mostly straight nice curve to the top they follow the same line so those are good those are hand sandable now now i'm going to move this 400 grit finish with some gator grit belts all the way down to the tip and then we're going to be hand sanding pretty soon on this I've probably put it this way before on some video, but uh, when I'm working with the Gator A45 belt, I like to think about future me and present me. And I try to be a good present me and not create more work for future me and make future me hate past me. For doing a slipshod work and being impatient at the grinder and leaving scratches for me to hand sand out. That's looking ready for the next step, I do believe. I keep a little EDM polishing stone right here in the coolant tray of the grinder, just so I can stone any burrs off of the surface of the mag chuck every now and then before I set a part down. It's good practice. Helps your accuracy. And here we're sticking the handle frame down it warped a little bit in heat treat, but I did leave it a little bit over thick um, in anticipation of that possibility. So here we go. Just taking it down a little bit to size. I think I took 20 to 30 thou off each side. I believe it was 20 thou per side though. In uh, 5 thou per pass. I'm not being too aggressive with the grinding here. And uh... I know you guys have seen me surface grind stuff before, but boy, <clears throat> again, let me say that uh, for anyone that can find the room for one of these in their shop, this is a super, super handy labor-saving tool, and it's just going to increase the convenience of a lot of the things you might find yourself wanting to build. So here's the second side just wrapping up, and... Uh, that should be ready to fit up to the knife. And we got a whole lot of work left to do. And please stay tuned for the next installment. And thanks for sticking with me this far. Um, we're going to get into fitting the ivory up next time. Don't forget to hammer that like button and maybe even subscribe. Thanks.